and turn with me, if you will, to the gospel as recorded, as recorded by Mark, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. We are reading today from the New King James Version, and the, our entire scripture lesson text can be found in the insert in your bulletins. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sin. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. And I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Pray with me this morning as we examine this text with this thought in mind. Preparing for good news. Preparing for good news. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity of standing before these our people. And Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen. Amen. Good news in the midst of bad news. I, I think a lot of you probably seen the Geico commercial where there's the bad news all around. And so one person has some good news and he interrupts the, the, the bad news to tell about the good news that's personal for him. As we move out of the old year and into the new year, there are many in this world, in this nation, and maybe in this, some in this building who are, are glad to see the old year gone and passed. Now, when we look back over this year, as over every year, there are some struggles that we had to face and some obstacles that we had to overcome that we just assume not see again. Last, each year brings its experiences that we're thankful that we got through by the grace of God, and we would not want to go through those same things again. So we look forward to the start of the new year as a time in which we can put the events of the old year behind us and look forward in anticipation to what the new year will bring. But the end of the year is also the time of the year that we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. During this time of year, Christians pause and reflect on the good news that the coming of Jesus brought into the world. The birth of Christ was good news to the entire world, even though most of the people at that time, in the world at that time, weren't even aware of his birth. The birth of Christ allowed the love of God to flow to at least a portion of the people in this world. And where would this world be if the love of God had not come into the world at that time? The birth of Jesus was good news to the entire world, even though the people to whom he was sent were not prepared to receive it. The Bible says in John 1.10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world did not know him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Jesus came into a world that was not prepared to receive the greatness of the gift that he was bringing. The world was not prepared, but it should have been. It should have been, because God had been announcing his intention from the very beginning of creation. But as people move farther away from obeying God, they move farther away from his promises. They move farther away from understanding his purposes. But when God makes a promise, he always follows through. God had made a promise that his Messiah would come. God had declared now through John the Baptist that his Messiah has come. That's the good news. That was, it was mighty good news. It was good news then, and it's good news now. But it's only good news to those who are prepared to receive it. So how do we do that? How do we prepare to receive the good news of the coming of Christ? The answer is in the text. So let's turn to the text to discover the preparation necessary for receiving God's good news. Look at the text again in, in verse 2. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. To receive God's good news, we must be ready to hear God's word. The Bible says in, in, in Romans 10 17, so that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We must be ready to hear because the promise of the gospel is hidden away in God's word. 
Verse 2 says, as it is written in the prophets, God gave a piece of the good news to every prophet that he sent to speak down through the years. He told Abraham that his seed would bless the whole world. The good news was hidden in that promise. He told Moses that he would send another prophet after him to whom the people would hear. The good news was hidden in that promise. He told David that his seed would sit on the throne of Israel forever. The good news was hidden in that promise. He told Isaiah that a son would be given, and his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The good news was hidden in that promise. He told Ezekiel that one day dead dry bones would come to life, stand up like a mighty army, and walk forth. The good news was hidden in that promise. The good news was there from the very beginning. In the book of Genesis, when God spoke to the serpent after, serpent after he had, had led Adam and Eve into sin, God told the serpent, who was Satan, that one day the seed of the woman would bruise his head. The good news was hidden in that promise. All of their, Jesus explained to the Pharisees, who were always dismissing his authority, that if they truly understood, understood the scriptures, they would realize that he was the fulfillment of all the promises of God. All of their hopes for eternal life resided in him. It was good news that God, it was the good news that God had hidden in all, all of God's promises. We must be ready to hear because God desired that his people be prepared for good news. Verse 3 said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. God wants his people to be prepared to hear his good news. That's why he sent John the Baptist to preach in the wilderness of Judea so that all Israel would begin to prepare their hearts for the coming Messiah. When you're expecting good news, you start to get ready for it when you're expecting it. If you know that you have friends coming over, you clean up the house in preparation of receiving them. If you know that you have a check coming in the mail, you will shovel your walk so the mailman will have a clear path to your mailbox so you can get that check. If you know that the diamond ring that you were expecting for Christmas is coming this morning by FedEx, you'll be at home to sign for the package. You would not want to be off at the mall shopping for knickknacks when the gift of great value arrives. Likewise, God wants his people to be prepared to receive his great gift of good news. He had promises of good news in his word. He sent his messages to spread the word. So we must be ready to hear God's word. We must be ready to hear because we will not be truly prepared for God's good news until we have acknowledged our sins and repented before God. Verse 5 says, then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So that's how we make the Lord's path straight. We do it by coming clean before him. When we do that, we give the Lord a straight path to our hearts. We do it by confessing those sins that are hidden away in our hearts. Those sins that God already knows about, but what can we hide from God? Absolutely nothing. But God requires that we come clean before him in humble submission and turn everything over to him. Everything. Our bad habits, our secret lusts, our envy, our anger, our pride, our attitudes, our resentment, everything. We need to have a Jordan River experience every day of our lives so that we may be prepared to receive God's blessing. For without repentance, there is no remission of sins. Without repentance, there is no cleansing. Without repentance, there is no blessing. If you're not cleansed by the word of God, you will not experience the good news of God. In John chapter 13, for example, Peter was offended when Jesus was attempting to wash his feet. He said, Lord, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus said to Peter, if I don't wash you, you'll have no part of this ministry. And Peter said, go ahead and wash me all over, from my head to my toe. The Lord will do symbolically what he does spiritually with all of his disciples. He washes them and prepares them for his service. To receive God's good news, we must be ready to hear God's word. But for God's word to be good news to us, we must do more than just hear. Not only must we hear it, we must accept it. We must accept it. Look again at the text. In verse 6 it says, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. To receive God's good news, we must be ready to accept God's Savior. We must be ready to accept God's Savior. Since we cannot be saved by our own good deeds, we must accept the provision of God. And God has made only one provision. That provision was the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is salvation in no other name 
uh, that Jesus, the Bible tells us that in Acts 4 and 2, 4 and 12. He says, but there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus, John testified that he was not the Savior. He said, I'm not mighty enough to be your Savior. The one who's coming after me is the mighty one. So we must be willing to, ready to accept God's Savior because his Savior is mighty. The New Testament is filled with the mighty works of Jesus. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He comforted those who were afflicted. He raised the dead. But I think that the Lord's own testimony tells the most about his mighty power to save. In the Gospel of John, Jesus used the declaration, I am, time after time, to declare his divine purpose. And most of the time when he, used, when he says I am, he ends it with the description of his authority and his power, his ability to do something. For example, he said in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He is a mighty savior. He said in another place in John 8.12, I am the light of the world. He who follows after me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He is a mighty savior. He said in another place in John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. He is a mighty savior. He said in another place in, in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He is a mighty savior. He said unto another place something else. In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father except through me. He is a mighty Savior. We must be ready to accept God's Savior, not only because he's mighty, but because he is the only way. He's the only way. There is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. And we must be ready to accept God's Savior, not only because he is mighty, but also because he is holy. John said in verse 7, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. John, the beloved apostle who wrote the Gospel of John, and John the Baptist were both testifying of the holiness of Jesus. And so it's only when we accept God's Savior that we recognize God's good news. And that's the time that we're ready to receive, when we recognize who he is and what he can do for us. But when you receive God's Savior, there's another gift that you must also receive before God's good news can have full effect on your life. Look finally at John, at verse 8, as John continues to explain God's good news. He said, I indeed baptize you with water, with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. To receive God's good news, we must be ready to receive God's Spirit. We must be ready to receive God's Spirit. Now, Spirit baptism is an act of God. We can't add anything to that. When we receive Jesus, we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, whether we're ready, to, ready for it or not. We can't add anything to it. But the Bible teaches us that it is the Holy Spirit who makes us understand God's Word, and it's the Holy Spirit who brings us to receive God's Savior, Jesus Christ. But what are the implications of being baptized in God's spirit? When we have received God's spirit, we, we view life in a brand new way. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. When we have received God's spirit, we begin to see new opportunities. We can say, like Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you have God's spirit, you have a strength that comes from within. So even when you're knocked down, you don't stay down. You say, like Paul, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. When you are baptized in God's spirit, you get back up, go back into the battle, and claim the victory that Christ has already won for you. You're able to do that because you have heard from God, and the news is good. So here's the greatest summary of the good news that can be found in the Bible. From the word of God, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? Amen. So we return now to the question with which we start. How do we prepare to receive God's good news? To receive God's good news, we must be ready to hear God's word. Don't let the devil tell you that you don't need God. 
To receive God's good news, we must be ready to accept God's Savior. There is no other way. To receive God's good news, we must be ready to receive God's Spirit. You cannot please God in your own power. You need the Spirit lifting you up and strengthening you and guiding you along the way. Once you have heard God's good news, then all the bad news in the world is irrelevant. It, 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 bad news is temporary. Good news is eternal. A thousand years after the last hurricane has blown across the earth, and a million years after the earth has quaked for the last time, those who have received God's good news will still be standing in, in glory, praising God. Praising God. I've heard the good news, and I'm ready to start praising God right now. I have heard the good news, and I'm ready to start spreading God's word right now. I've heard the good news, and I'm ready to accept God's Savior right now. I have heard the good news, and I'm ready to receive God's Spirit right now. I've heard the good news, and I'm ready to start sharing God's gospel. I've heard the good news, and I'm ready to declare that the kingdom of God resides in my, resides in my heart. I'm ready to declare the good news to the world. What about you? What about you? Shall we stand at the choir leads us in song? <clears throat>